Artificial neural network is a computing system designed to replicate the way humans analyze and work. It forms the base of all artificial intelligence concepts. That is why we have come up with this tutorial on neural networks. Now, before we go ahead with the session, I'd like to inform you guys that we have launched a completely free platform called Great Learning Academy, where you can have access to free courses such as AI, cloud, and digital marketing. You can check out the details in the description below. Now, let's have a quick glance at the agenda. So we'll start off with a comprehensive introduction to artificial intelligence and deep learning. Then we'll understand what are biological neural networks and how it inspired us to come up with the concept of artificial neural networks. Going ahead, we'll understand the implementation of artificial neural networks, following which we'll comprehensively understand what is backpropagation. And then finally, we'll have a demo where we'll be implementing these artificial neural networks with the R language. So let's start off with the session. In this video, we will see what is artificial intelligence? What does it mean? How it has evolved over a period of time? And what does it mean to you and me? And what does it hold for us in the future? Artificial intelligence has been gaining a huge momentum in the recent world and it's making a tremendous impact in our career outcomes. But before we delve into that, let's understand what is artificial intelligence. So what is AI? Let me ask you a question. Look at the photo above and can you guess who that famous personality is? I think most of you guys would have guessed that it is Albert Einstein. But it's not an easy problem. Think about how your brain processed that information and how did it recognize it. It might have noticed the facial features. It might have noticed the curly hairs. It might have noticed the distance between the eyes. It might have noticed another million features to come to the conclusion that it is Albert Einstein. So can you make a machine to think the same way which you think? That's AI. The process of making a machine to think like how a human does is what is known as AI. However, humans' ability to think and make a rational decision in a critical situation is unparalleled. And even science is not able to crack that. So what does machines have for them? How is it superior? And how is it doing good? What do they have is computational power. And this has grown massively in the recent years. Let me ask you, what is the square root of 200? You'll not be able to tell me in a second, but where is the computer scan? But if you were to ask a computer to take a bottle of water from your kitchen, will it be able to? Well, the computer needs to know what does a bottle mean? What does water mean? And how to move? And where is the kitchen? Whereas the humans don't have any problem in that. So making a computer to learn about its surroundings, adapt and then grow is also AI. Yeah. The term artificial intelligence has been around since a long time. It was first coined in 1956 by Mr. John McCarthy at the DARPA conference. Though the conference was a hit and it garnished a lot of attention from a lot of players, well, creating these machines or creating the smart machines required a lot of computational power and hardware, which was apparently not there at that point of time. Well, the tipping point came in the late 90s, where IBM's Deep Blue stunned the entire world by defeating the world champion at a chess tournament. Though not a fully functional AI, we see fragments of AI implementation in our daily day-to-day -day life. Think of the next time when you type in Google to search something. Well, how does it come up with the fact, what are you going to type next? Well, Google has tons of data based upon what have you typed so far. And its AI algorithms are running out the back to find out what are you going to type next based upon what have you typed. Netflix predicts what movies you want to watch next based upon what movies you have watched in the past. Whereas Facebook detects all your friends in the same photo which you have taken and uploaded based upon the information it has gathered in the past about your friends in your own profile. AI is usually divided into two broader categories machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning is the use of statistical methods to understand and analyze information from a given data. Whereas deep learning, a broader area of machine learning or a broader subset of machine learning mostly deals with neural networks. With computational power growing exponentially year on year, the scope of AI has become vast and is being used in almost all the domains, in all the verticals and across all the industries, be it IT, retail, telecom, BFSI, 
travel, e-commerce, any of these industries, AI and ML has a future in all the facets of these industries. Hope this video was helpful to you guys. If you like this video, like, share and subscribe to our channel and stay connected with us for future updates. So with neural networks, uh, we'll start off with um, seeing briefly what a biological neural network is. Um, we won't go into much of the details. We'll just do an overview because it helps to understand uh, what an artificial neural network does. Um, then we'll see the overview of artificial neural network and a small example, uh, a pretty small example on uh, what happens and how a neural network learns. Uh, we'll see how we implement AA and, and, and um, different steps that are a part of implementing artificial neural network. Uh, one of them being backpropagation, then um, the weights updation, and then the error function. Then we'll also see the um, summary of what the overall learning algorithm that the neural network follows. And then we'll see how we implement neural network in R using the same, um, using that same iris data set that we used to do so that we only know what is the essence of using neural uh, network in R and we're able to compare the outputs of what we did with previous algorithms and what the neural network gives us. Okay, so with biological neural networks, you would have seen already how um, they're the basic building blocks of the um, certain, or sorry, the central nervous system. So these are the diagrams which may be repetitive for you, but then they help us understand what a biological neural network does. So not going very deep into biology. Um, so something that you see in yellow is a neuron, okay, which is similar to a neuron in the artificial neural network, uh, wherein each contains some data about the um, input data variables. Okay, so like the neurons are interconnected at the point called synapses. So in the diagram above, um, you see a red circle where there is a synapse. So the neurons are interconnected at the point called synapses. And this is similar to the artificial neural network because um, the different input variables that you take, um, that information is passed to the hidden layer and how that information is passed to the hidden layers is through a point which is similar to the synapse in the biological neural network. Um, so there are three parts that are typically present in the biological neural network. Uh, one is the dendrite, which is the yellow, um, um, you can say like terminals of a neural network, uh, which are responsible to receive signals from the surrounding neurons. Then there are axons, which are nothing like a path. So uh, comparing it to the artificial neural network, like there is a path when you go from the input layer to the hidden layer, um, there is a path in between uh, which carries the information so the axon is similar to that then the synopsis uh, synapses are responsible for receiving the signals and learning from the past activities how we correlate it to the artificial neural network is um, because if you if you know of the concept of back propagation even the artificial neural network learns from its past activities hence you're able to uh, kind of relate the biological neural network with the artificial neural network so each of the neuron here acts as a neuron in the artificial neural network um, the axons act as a path where the information is um, traversed from one layer of neural network to the another layer of the neural network then the dendrites and synapses are used to send and receive information between one neuron to the other and then they also enable um, the neural network to learn from the past activities and that's how the algorithm improves itself okay so uh, this is essential to understand only because the artificial neural uh, network gets its name from the biological neural network only Okay, um, so this is again um, a small diagram to just show you how the information is passed uh, with the biological neural network and a similar kind of thing happens with the um, artificial neural network as well. <laughs> 
Okay, so what happens is uh, whenever a certain information is um, coming to a neuron, when a certain information is present in a neuron, um, so there's this thing called threshold, which we're also seen with the artificial neural network. So once that threshold has reached, one that uh, threshold has um, been achieved, the neural network transmits a signal through the axon. And a similar kind of thing happens with the artificial neural network as well. Whenever the threshold is reached, uh, activation function triggers and then an information is passed from the inf input um, layer to the output layer. So we'll see how each of these um, steps in the biological neural network helps us also understand what is present in the artificial neural network. Okay, so this is uh, how uh, a basic of how an artificial neural network works. Um, so the inputs that you see here are nothing but the input data variables uh, with the data set they are working with. Um, then there are certain weights which are applied uh, to each of the input variables. Um, so the weights that are applied are nothing but they help the neural network to tell what is the importance of each of the variables. So this is also what we saw with the previous algorithms we learned. So each variable that is present in our um, input data set does not have equal importance. Okay, Each input variable does not have equal importance. There are variables which are more important. There are variables which are lesser important. How that is decided is through these weights. So whichever variable is given a higher weight is comparatively more important important than a variable which has a lesser weight. So this is how the weights are um, used in a neural network. So the set of inputs which are nothing but um, the variables from the data set are thought of as neurons. This is how we correlate an artificial neural network with a biological neural network. Uh, so then they are weighed according to the weights that are applied, what I just told. And finally, this is uh, we do kind of a sum product of the input variables with the weights. Sum product means to say um, x1 into w1 plus x2 into w2 plus x3 into w3 and so on okay so the function um, that you see here the summation function or the sigma function here this can also be called as a transfer function so this actually performs the sum product so it will sum up the weights and the input that it receives from each of the neurons the next step is uh, to go to the activation function, which will decide whether or not a neuron will fire. So this is similar to the biological neural network, wherein with the threshold, we decide whether or not um, the information should be sent to the next layer. Okay. So if if the threshold uh, so whatever sum you get using the transfer function uh, you compare it to the threshold if it exceeds the threshold the activation function decides to fire when it fires the information is passed from the input layer to the output layer like similar to what happens in the biological neural network when the activation function fires information is passed from one layer to the other Okay, so like I told earlier also, the weights can be used to amplify or de-amplify the original input signal, meaning to say they are they are used to determine how each variable will be used, um, what is the importance that will be given to each of the variables. Okay, so consider a simple example. So this example has got nothing to do with the neural networks actually. Um, consider that you have to say two input variables x1 and x2. Um, so these are two input variables in a data set, one of them having a, va a value of 0 0.6 and one of them having a value of 1. Um, and the weights say that are applied to both of these input variables are 0 0.5 and 0. Eight. Okay, and you've also been given a threshold of one. 
So what happens um, in simple terms in the neural network is uh, the first step of a transfer function, what we saw in the previous slide. Uh, so nothing but a sum product will happen here. So 0 0.6 into 0 0.5 plus 1 into 0 0.8. Um, so that gives you a 1.1. So this is similar to the uh, summation function that we had seen here. Um, next, we compare this uh, value that we've got with the threshold. So say our value uh, that we've got is 1.1, but the threshold is 1.0. So we see that our output is more than the threshold that was allowed. So since the output is greater than the threshold, so the neuron is activated and it fires. Okay, so this is a, a very simple example. This is not what actually happens in the neural network because there an, a derivative of the error function and all that is calculated. So error function is nothing but the actual output, uh, a difference between the actual output and the desired output. So there an, a derivative of that is calculated and passed back to the um, uh, neural network but I, I put this example only to show you how the threshold works um, so when whenever the output exceeds the threshold the neural network will know that it needs to fire um, a signal what is meant by firing a signal is nothing but a back propagation meaning to say that whenever an output increases the threshold um, the algorithm will, uh, sorry, whenever the output increases the threshold, a back propagation will occur and a reiteration will occur, a new iteration within the neural network will occur and the output, uh, the algorithm will try to improve the output. Okay. Now we'll see how we uh, implement the artificial neural network. Um, so this is a simple diagram to show how a neural network works. So there are, for example, three input variables and two output variables here. Um, so they can be any number of hidden layers that are present um, in the neural network and the hidden layers actually perform whatever um, the algorithm needs to be applied is done by the hidden layers only. Uh, there are different ways on how we decide uh, how many hidden layers are to be present and we'll see that when we work with R. Um, so what happens here is that the input layer will take the input from the input variables. So say you have three variables here. So each input, each of the neuron that you see in the input layer will have data from one variable each. The input layer will take input from the input variables. The in hidden layer will help the input layer to move to the output layer. Okay, so the input layer will pass the information to the hidden layer with the weights present and then the hidden layer will move that data to the output layer but the hidden layer is essentially a big black box layer like i told you earlier you will never be able to understand what is happening with the hidden layer and the output layer will throw you the final output so this is another way to um, a more detailed uh, diagram of the above uh, diagram. So what I'm trying to show here is that there could be any number of nodes that one can be present at every layer. And then there are weights that are applied to the inputs. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So then there are weights that are applied to the inputs that take them to the hidden layer. So if you see in the diagram below, there are three inputs, one, two, three. And then there are some weights which are applied to the each of um, the inputs when it is being taken to the hidden layer. So each input variable with some weight applied will go to each neuron in the hidden layer. So if there are three input variables and there are um, three hidden layers, so each of the inputs, like the input um, I1 will go to each of the neuron in the hidden layer and a different weight will be applied when it goes through each um, 
of the neuron in the hidden layer. And there is another category of weights. So one is the weights that are applied to the input variables. There is another category of weight which we call as the bias values. Um, so bias values are again used to train the neural network. Um, so this this can be compared to if you remember with um, the regression also we used to have a similar thing wherein now uh, we'll have some weights that are assigned to each of the variables. So that were the coefficients back in uh, regression when uh, you used to get an equation something like y equals to um, a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus b3 x3 and so on. So when there were coefficients uh, in regression are the weights which are in the neural network, but there was also an intercept which was the unexplained uh, variance or unexplained output that the intercept used to capture. So similar happens here with the hidden bias. So if there is some information that the input input variables along with the weights cannot capture that is captured by the hidden bias so with each of um, the layer that you have apart from the input layer there will be a bias added like if you see in the diagram here with the second layer uh, that is the hidden layer present in the between there's a hidden bias that is added and with each hidden layer that you have like here we have just hidden layer but with each hidden layer that is present there will be a hidden bias for each of the layers and finally there all there will also be an output bias which is present for the output layer nothing but the intercept what we used to have with the regression equation okay that was the basic of what an artificial neural network does. Uh, we'll go to back propagation now to see how the neural network learns. Okay, so the basis of a neural network is a powerful learning mechanism. Um, although it is a powerful learning mechanism, but you will never be able to understand um, what that learning mechanism is. Um, but that being said, the neural network has a powerful learning mechanism and it can learn any function given it has enough hidden units so each of the hidden units that are present enable it to learn to the um, input data set um, and how it learns is by the mechanism that we call as backpropagation okay so like I told you earlier also, when an input is fed to the neural network, that is when the input variables are fed into the neural network, um, the input will, some weights will be applied to the input that is uh, coming. Some bias will be applied to the, in addition to the input that is coming. And finally, um, that data will go to the hidden layer. The same process will be repeated and the data will move to the output layer. When you get the data at the output layer, the difference between what the actual output or the desired output was and the output that you are getting, some error will be calculated based on the difference whatever is the error will be fed back to the uh, first layer and the whole process repeats again okay so these errors are fed back to the neural network and then these weights to the question that you were asking the weights are then changed in order to try to reduce the errors and give the correct output so in the first iteration random weights will be assigned but with each iteration that happens the weights are changed um, using the errors that we have got in the previous layer so this is the diagram that explains back propagation so there are some input variables then there is a hidden layer so say there are uh, three input variables here then there are two hidden um, neurons with the hidden layer so each of the input variables is being um, fed to the hidden layer and then there's also a bias which is being applied and 
then from the hidden layer we're going to the output layer and the output layer the error calculation happens which is nothing but the difference between the actual value and the calculated value whatever is the error calculation is back propagated and then the weights are modified this happens each time the algorithm runs and that's how the weights are improved and that's how the algorithm loads okay okay um, so then once uh, you're done with back propagation so all you did with back propagation was to uh, get the error and pass it back to the um, input layer so that the weights are modified now how the weights are modified is um, after you've done the back propagation you need to update the weights now if you remember with the previous slide that we've seen here there are weights applied to the hidden layer and then there are weights applied to the output layer as well so both of these weights are different okay so um don't get too confused with what uh the equation here is but this is just meant to show that there are two different weights that are applied uh, to both of the layers so wij that you see here is the weight that is um passed to the variables from the input layer and wjk is the uh, weights that are applied to the neurons from the hidden layer okay so both of them will learn from the errors that they are doing and both of the weights will be updated uh, don't go very deep into what the mathematical terms here are but this is just meant to tell you that both of the weights will be modified based on the error that we are seeing from the previous iteration of the algorithm there's another thing which you would be see uh, which you're seeing here which is um, the alpha value um, so alpha value is nothing but the learning rate learning rate means to say at what rate do you want the neural network to learn so this is nothing but the learning speed okay if you make the learning speed too quickly um, or you make the alpha value you don't really specify these values this is what happens in the background but if the learning speed is uh, very quickly the uh, sorry the learning speed is very fast or an alpha value is closer to one the algorithm would not be able to learn properly this is nothing like nothing but um, trying to say that you're trying to learn something very quickly so you just run over it you don't understand the essence of what was there in the data and if if you uh, make the learning rate very small you don't allow the algorithm to grow you don't allow the algorithm to learn only so an optimal learning rate is chosen but you don't choose it choose it the algorithm chooses it itself but an optimal uh, learning rate is chosen for each iteration that happens with the neural network so when back propagation will occur some errors would have occurred and then a back propagation will occur that error will be passed back to the um algorithm the weights that are being passed that are being applied to the input data variables will be modified the weights that are being applied to the hidden layer will also be modified and finally a new output will be produced and this process repeats across multiple iterations and each time the weights will be updated okay um then we come to the error function error function is nothing but again the difference between the actual value and the desired value here um so although this is a repetition but um uh, the input variable will be passed through a system so adaptive system here is nothing but the uh, hidden layer and then you get a output y you compare that output to the desired output whatever is the error is passed back to the adaptive system nothing but the hidden layer then the weights are modified um, so one thing to keep in mind is that the error should satisfy some particular properties uh, this was this was present in the videos as well that we saw uh, the first thing being that the error should be um, 
derivable meaning to say that it, it should be possible to do a derivative derivative is nothing but d by dx what we used to do back in 11 12th mathematics um, so it, it should be possible to do a derivative why um, to answer to one of the questions earlier uh, the threshold that we calculate the threshold that we specify is a derivative of the error okay so if if it is uh, not derivable so the threshold thing will not work the threshold that we are specifying that we are telling the algorithm is nothing but derivative of the error that we are getting in each layer okay um as so this is very obvious although but as the output moves towards the desired value the error should obviously move to zero error should be negative again for the reason that we should be able to do a derivative of it um, and then uh, we need to choose um, the error the error value sorry we're not choosing the error value ac uh, actually but then uh, when there is a too low value for the error or there are too high values for the error that actually um, impact how the neural network works if the error value is too high the accuracy of the neural network will be bad and then it will take a lot of iterations to uh, be able to learn and if the error value is too small sorry that i've put it uh, opposite so if the error value is high then um, the neural network will take a long time to learn i'll, I'll just change it after the session okay uh, so we'll finally see an overview of what happens with the learning algorithms um with the learning algorithm overall so the back propagation actually allows the neural network to get trained similar to how we train all the machine learning or the data mining models similar way the back propagation allows the neural network to learn um, this happens in multiple iterations what i've been calling so far uh, these iterations in terms of neural network are also called as epochs um, so it goes through several epochs before the network has sufficiently learned to handle all the data that is provided uh, this is again a different diagram shown in a different way um, to show how back propagation works but for that will happen. This is um, that will happen for each of the iteration or each of the epochs. Uh, the input data will be fed. The output data will be compared against the desired value, and then it will be uh, whatever the error will be will be back propagated um, using the error to update the weights. Um, now, when will um, this stop? Uh, meaning to say that each time when um, a particular error is calculated based on uh, what was the output versus what was the desired output and then a back propagation occurs so this process keeps on repeating so like we used to have a pruning step or a stopping criteria uh, for the decision trees that we saw last week similarly there should be a stopping criteria here as well um, so multiple stopping criteria can be used for neural networks one of them being a desired mean square error and one of them being elapsed epochs um, desired mean square error tells what is the error that we can allow the data to have uh, what is the flexibility that we're giving the data to have uh, and elapsed epochs is nothing but what is the number of iterations that we want so a neural network cannot run indefinitely through 10,000 or 1 lakh iterations. Um, so this varies with the data that you have, but it cannot run indefinitely. So we need to specify the number of iterations for which a neural network should run. So both of these um, are used as stopping criteria for the neural network. Okay, um, so again, I'm using the Iris data set that we had um, seen with the previous um, algorithms as well um, to give you a quick revision of what the iris data set was so this data set has 150 um, entries and which there are four input variables which are sepal length width and petal length and width and finally there are three species 50 um, of each species and the aim of this algorithm is to uh, try to predict what 
the partic what is the species of a particular flower given its attributes of sepal and petal length so with the last session we tried to predict the species using cart um using um random forest uh, we also saw the same example with um, clustering as well when we were trying to use the sepal length width and petal length and width to uh, try to cluster these uh, flowers together so we'll use that same data set um, I'm repeating the steps what we did earlier of uh, generating a random number shuffling the data so this again is a um, optional step but i normally do it so that there's no biasness which is present in the data one important step uh, which you can note down here is the line number 12 um that i have uh with the r code so if you remember with um neural network uh this was being done in um, the example that we did and this will also be useful in the example that you do with uh, your mini project so if there is any variable which is a categorical variable something like um the species that you have here when it where is this where it is setosa uh, versicolor and virginica when you have three species you cannot have the data in this format when you work with neural networks so you need to have um three columns which are in forms of uh one and zero so um either you can do that with multiple commands either you can create um three new input variables and then uh, pass one or and zero here but a simple step a simple command is the class dot uh ind command which you can use in one go to create all the three variables let me show that to you how it happens so if you see here with a single command i'm able to segregate the initial species that i had if you see the species i had here was um in the form of setosa virginica and versicolor and then i've split that data in form of zero and one with one single step okay so um what was done earlier was we used to create we used to do that uh for each of the variables one by one but using this command you can now uh, very simply split the data in the required format okay and as a shortcut what i've also done is i've done the scaling in the same command here so what i essentially did was from the initial iris and data set that i had i scaled the first four variables so the first four variables of sepal length width petal length and width was scaled and then this width uh the output variable which was one was split in the form of zero one one to be able to fit the neural network so then i am um, simply dividing my data set into training and testing data set uh, so roughly a 70 30 but not exactly uh, so first 100 i'm passing to my first 100 rows i'm passing to my training data set and uh, next 50 to my testing data set and finally i'm creating a neural network so we'll see here what is the parameters that we pass to the neural network um so the first thing is the formula that we need to give here so the formula here tells me that these three which now become my um output variables um c setosa versicolor and virginica which now become my output variables are a function of four independent or the input variables so this is the formula that i've specified data is the training data set hidden specifies the number of hidden layers that you want um so a thumb rule to choose the hidden layers is a uh, under root of the number of uh, input variables that you have so if you have i had four input variables here so i chose two okay and um since you saw you can have multiple hidden layers here um so say if you have um uh maybe like here i had check input variables and hidden layers so since i had four input variables i did a square root of um 
this to choose that I'll have two hidden hidden equals to two here. Give me a second. Okay. And um, sorry, uh, so two here means I'm rounding it off to get a two. So that will mean that I have one hidden layer with two neurons. Say you have um, maybe 20 input variables of in place of four. So you do a square root of 20, which will be 4.47. Now you round it off to five. Then you do a square root of five and that will be 2.23 so you can round it off to probably two or three so what i'm trying to tell you is that when there are four input variables i'll have just one hidden layer uh, which will have two nodes when you have say 20 input variables you'll have two hidden layers the first of which will have five hidden neurons the second of which will have um two neurons Okay, I'm making sense. Um, like if I have 100 input variables, I'll have a first hidden layer which will have 10 neurons, then I'll have second hidden layer which will have three neurons. Then, uh, yeah, so that will be here. Um, say I have 500 input data variables, so I have first hidden layer which will have. Um, say 22 hidden sorry i'll have first hidden layer which will have 22 neurons then i'll have um second hidden layer which will have 4.7 or you can round it off to five neurons then again i'll have third hidden layer which will have two neurons so this is how you decide the number of hidden layers that you have with the data and number of neurons that will be present in each hidden layer let me let me kind of erase that and do this again okay so input variables and then the hidden layers so when i had four input variables i do a square root of four that will be two so i have one input layer which has so this will be the first hidden layer with two neurons okay so you kind of keep doing the square root multiple times so i'm doing a square root here the first time second time when i do a square root of two i come to approximately one so then i stop okay meaning to say when i have four input variables i get a two so that will be first hidden layer with two neurons say if i have 10 input variables i'll do a square root which is approximately equals to three so i'll have a first hidden layer with three neurons and then I'll do a square root of 3, which is 1.7, and you can round it off to 2. So I'll have a second hidden layer with 2 neurons. Okay. Now, now, if you do a square root, you keep on doing the square root iteratively. Uh, so now, if you do a square root, you will get something like 1.1.4 or something. So there you stop. So with 10 input variables, you'll have two hidden layers. So with the hidden yeah. layer parameter that you're specifying here, I did a two here uh, because I had just one hidden layer. So you need to give um, hidden equals to two here. With the 10 input variables, you need to give hidden equals to C of three comma two three means first with three neurons second with two neurons okay like a bigger example if we take i have 500 input variables so i do a square root of 500 that will be 
say 22.36 and I'm rounding it off to 22. So I'll have first hidden layer with 22 neurons. Then I'm doing a um, square root of 22. That gives me 4.69 and if I round it off to 5, so I'll have a second hidden layer with 5 neurons. Then I do a square root of 5. Square root of 5, which gives me 2.23, so I round it off to 2 for example. So then I'll get a third hidden layer with um, 2 neurons. And then when I'm doing this with R, I'll give hidden equals to 22 comma 5 comma 2. So this means three layers, first having 22 neurons, second having five neurons, third having two neurons. Okay, um, so next is uh, the threshold. So threshold is nothing but a derivative of the error that will be calculated at um, each step. So we can also see that from the help in R. See the threshold. So threshold is numerical value specifying the threshold for the partial derivative of the error function as a stopping criteria. So at each step, some error will be calculated as a difference of the actual value and the desired value and then you calculate a derivative of it. So say the error um, in the first step is 2 for example, um, so you calculate a derivative of it, then back propagation will occur, then a reiteration will occur and this process keeps repeating. So this threshold equals to 0 0.01 says that keep repeating until you receive a derivative of the error function which is 0 0.01. Okay. So in the first uh, the first iteration may be a uh, deriv derivative of the error function will be say for example 1 then you back propagate reiteration occurs then the derivative of the error function maybe comes down to 0 0.9 then you repeat it back propagation occurs then uh, maybe the derivative of the error function comes down to be 0 0.6 then 0 0.2 0 0.1 and till it comes down to 0 0.1 you need to keep repeating the algorithm Okay. Um, the next step is so this is um, one stopping criteria. Threshold is one stopping criteria. Step max tells you what is the number of iterations you want. It, it is possible that um, even with 10,000 iterations or 10,000 cycles, the threshold doesn't reach 0 0.01. Doesn't mean that you'll keep running this algorithm infinite times. Step max is another stopping criteria, which tells us what is the number of iterations that we can allow our neural network to have. So step max equals to 2,000 tells us that we need to, um, we can run this algorithm a maximum of 2,000 times. Okay, uh, so linear output equals to false is nothing but um, telling whether or not you want the activation function to work. So uh, to revisit activation function was nothing but allowing a neural network to fire a trigger. Uh, firing a trigger means allowing a neural network to backfire. So, sorry, back propagate. So when, when you specify linear output equals to false, that means that you're allowing the activation function. Okay, uh, so uh, um, with, with the lectures, there were different activation functions that were also given, but um, there is not much difference, practically speaking, with uh, the different activation functions. And even if you don't specify it explicitly with your commands, you're, you're not missing out anything. Just specify that linear output is equals to false. This is enough to tell R that you want the activation function to work. Okay, um, then life sign equals to full and life sign dot step equals to 10 are again optional steps. Um, these are only to tell R that 
say I am telling here that I want 2000 iterations. Uh, so these two steps are only to tell R that I want to see the output after every 10th iteration. If you if you step if you skip this step, even then the algorithm will run, but it will not show you what is happening with uh, each step. So when I'm telling R that I want the life science step to be 10. So after each 10 iterations, like after 10 iterations, after 20, after 30, after 40, so on till 2000, R will show me what is happening with the neural network. If you skip this, it will directly give you an output. Okay, then uh, error.fct is nothing but uh, telling you how do you calculate the error function. Okay, um, so error is error function is nothing but difference of the um, actual value and the desired value. But how do you calculate it? SSEA sum of squares error. And this is the best you can do with neural networks because with neural networks, you want your error to be positive uh, so that you're able to do a derivative of it. Um, so the best thing to use is an SSE, which is sum of squares error. So supplying all these parameters when I run this command, sorry. Okay. So I ran this command. See, there are two hidden neurons. That was what I had specified uh, with each iteration so I told that I can do a maximum of 2000 steps uh, but my algorithm stopped with 125 steps uh, so when there were 10 steps when 10 iterations had occurred my error was 2.869 after 20 it reduced to 2.795 after 30 it reduced to 1.487 and finally after 125 iterations my error reduced to 0 0.03541 um, so the stopping criteria which worked here was this threshold so a derivative of 0.0351 would have been lesser than 0.01 and hence it stopped here okay um, so once the error of 0.03541 was achieved this uh, was achieved with 125 steps so I did not have to do 2000 steps I got the output with each 10 iterations you see you can you could have uh, done a life sign step of one to see what happened with each iteration but then it becomes too detailed uh, so with each 10 iteration you see the error was reducing and finally it came down to 0 0.0351 and this occurred in 17 seconds only okay now if i kind of try to plot the neural network this is what i get so see there are four input variables, sepal length, width, petal length and width. Uh, I have just one um, hidden layer that has two neurons. Uh, these are the weights, the ones that you see 1.83 on the top. Second. Yeah, so this 1.3 that you see, 1.83 that you see here is the weight. These are all the weights that you're seeing. Um, then the zero, the 6.6 .6 that you see here, the minus 12 that you see here. Sorry, uh, these are the biases. So 1.83, 0 0.76, the one that you see on the black lines are the weights that are being applied to the input variables. The ones that you see in blue 6.6 .6 and 1.2, these are the biases which are being applied. So there's just one hidden layer with two neurons. The biases are being applied at both the layers, the base, uh, the hidden, sorry, the weights are being applied to both the layers and finally an output is being thrown out okay uh, one thing to note here is um, that if I run the same command again the weights will be different okay so if you run the same command at the same time will me even then this will be different uh, so so far what is happening is um, 
iris underscore n is a neural network model which is being created it's just showing you that these were the four input variables uh, these were the three output variables and something is happening and this neural network is getting trained okay um one additional step which can be done here is um not with the small data set that i'm using but if you have larger data sets uh one another parameter that you can pass with the neural network command is um this step uh this parameter called start weights okay uh so what this is doing is that even though uh, with back propagation the errors are being passed um, and then the weights are being modified but additionally you can also pass the weights of the first step to the second step meaning to say uh, whatever were the weights that were being applied in my first step i can also pass them as a parameter when i'm back propagating uh, to the second step so that the same weights are not being used so this becomes an additional learning for the neural network uh, so this is not applicable in the small data set that i'm using it will, it won't do any benefit but for the larger data sets that are present the steps become helpful and i'll show you how you do that um so you create another variable old weight or you can name it anything and in the iris underscore n was the name of the model that i've created that has some weights so i'm passing those weights to a new variable and then i can create another neural network which has the same parameters Additionally, I'm adding a parameter called as start weights, in which I am passing the old weights, that is the weights that I received in the first iteration. So this is an additional step you can do to improve the performance of your uh, neural network. Okay, so so far with iris underscore n, I've just created a model. Now we'll see how does our model work. Okay, so what I'll do with uh, what I'll do here is uh, with the data set here, I had used the training data set to create a model. Next, I'll be using the test data set to see how my model performs. So, um, because I had scaled my training data set, so I'll also be scaling my testing data set and try to predict the outputs of the testing data set so i'm using a compute function to calculate predict the values of the output uh, sorry the testing data set iris underscore n is the model that i had created neural network model that i created and the data that i'm passing is the test data set first four columns which are nothing but the sepal length width better than the width okay so finally when i predict when i try to predict the values of my test data set this is what happens um now since this is a scaled data set so the numbers are achieved in this way but you can again uh, use these numbers as well to also do a prediction let's see how do we do that um so you see we had three species which were possible um and in the results that i got i get uh, these are 50 entries which was in the test data set and I get some scores for each of the species like for this particular uh, flower I get three values for each of the species um, so the score the probability that it is a setosa is 0 0.001 the probability that it is versicolor is 0 0.01 whereas the probability that it is virginica is 90 9 0.99 which is 99 percent so this flower which is in the row number 131 will be a virginica similarly the flower which is in this row 10th will be a setosa the flower which is in row 95 will be a worsi color the flower which is in 142 will be again a virginica this one will be a worsi color so what I'm essentially doing here is I'm trying to use the neural network model to predict what will be the class of my flowers in my testing data set.
Okay, so pass the testing data set. I pass the neural network model, which contains the learnings that it has from the training data set. And I'm used this to do, doing this to predict. So this, this is the main step. Do not get confused with the other steps because I'm just uh, doing kind of formatting to give you a nice looking output there. But with this step, I'm trying to predict the values in the testing data set using the learnings I have from the neural network model. Okay, so with the results that I got here, I'll kind of try to compare it. So these are the predictions that my um, uh, neural network model is making. These are the these are the predictions that I'm trying to make for my um, uh, testing data set using the neural network. But I should also be able to compare it uh, to the actual values to see how good my neural network is doing. Um, so. Okay, uh, what I did with this step was nothing but uh, I tried to, like I was telling you theoretically here on how this would be a virginica and this would be a setosa and this again will be a versi color. So I kind of tried to uh, put that in words so that we don't have to read through the numbers so these three commands that i'm doing uh, here are doing nothing but producing this result from this result so the first one should be a virginica the second should be a setosa the third should be a versi color this is what i'm doing here telling r that whichever is maximum out of uh, the three columns i want that column name to come in my result so this is the result that i get as a result of prediction after my neural network for the 50 entries that i had in my test data set these are the predict species of the flowers using my neural network model. Now I'll be using these 50 predicted values against the initial um, in the, against the actual values to see how good my neural network is doing. Okay, so these are the original values which were present and these are the values that I've got and we'll finally compare them in the table. So you see we have out of 50, um, so this, this matrix, if you don't know it already, we call it as a confusion matrix uh, to see how good, how good our models do. So we see there is an error of three here out of 50 there is an error of three so 47 values are being calculated fine and hence the accuracy of this model is 94 percent to tell you uh, quickly again what i did here i uh, used my neural network model to predict what species each of my uh, flower belongs to in the testing data set then i compared it with um, the actual species which were present and finally I get this table which tells me that I have an accuracy of 94%. Okay so weights will change according to the error uh, whatever the error is. The end aim is to get a threshold of 0 0.01 passing whatever weights possible. So it is entirely possible that when you run this algorithm the second time um, uh, if you remember here we had done this with 125 steps okay when you run this the second time it may take lesser steps it may take more steps but towards the end your result will be the same okay because the algorithm will stop when it achieves a threshold of 0.01 uh, so just to tell you i'm running this algorithm fourth time since yesterday uh once it has run with 300 steps, once it ran with some 95, 96 steps, and once it is running with 125 steps now, but your end accuracy will be uh, the same, the same, um, um, this thing, the same confusion matrix you will get no matter how many times you run the same algorithm because it will use the threshold to stop and the weights can be anything. Okay, so uh, for today's session, I'll just be doing an um, exploratory data analysis that will help you just see which variables should be used and which should not be used. What's the next session? We'll try to um, actually solve it to see which, uh, what is the output that each of the algorithm throws.
you i'm importing the data set okay so when i'm viewing this data set it contains approximately 3000 uh, or like 2940 rows and it has 35 columns um structure is just an additional step to see what the structure is so we have a total of 2940 rows and then we'll now go to each of the variables individually so when i start off with the address and variable one thing to note here is that these variables have been arranged in an alphabetical order um so you need to um, if, if for better understanding, uh, you might want to um, rearrange these columns so that similar columns are together. I haven't done that, but maybe you can do that um, arranging the similar columns next to each other so that it becomes easier for understanding. Uh, so we see here when we start off with attrition, um, so there are a total of 2940 employees out of which um, 474 uh, had an attrition okay so that becomes 474 upon 295 2940 so approximately um 16 percent of people had an attrition and we'll see what impacts the attrition of these 16 percent of the employees okay so we'll start off with each of the variables one by one and um see whether or not that variable should be included here so i'm starting off with the age which is the first variable here um so you see the minimum age is 18 the maximum is 60 uh, and the median <coughs> excuse me the median is 36 which is somewhere in the mid um so the data looks like not being very skewed um we do a box plot of it and we see that it looks like a normal curve the age so there are people from the ages 18 to 60 um, and the data is normally distributed now i'm trying to see uh, so this is another way i did a box plot and this is another way to de do a clearer histogram we could have done it using the hist function as well but you can also use ggplot to do a histogram which gives you a more precise histogram to see the distribution of the age um, and finally i'm again using ggplot to see the impact of age so what i did here was for the continuous variables that were there with the data set i'll try to see whether what is the impact that those variables have so when i do a ggplot of the age i get an output something like this so what this tells me is uh, the pink color shows the employees that have an attrition and that do not have an attrition and the blue color shows the employees that have an attrition so what this tells me is that um, the people who have an attrition or who uh, uh, who had an attrition are belong belong to the age somewhere from probably 28 to 30 nine and the ones that who do not have an attrition uh, have an age somewhere from 31 to say 43 um what this tells us is that when you're seeing just the age variable alone there is a difference uh, in the ages when the people have an attrition or not so people in the smaller in the younger age groups are more likely to have an attrition compared to people in the um, larger age groups so this helps us understand that when we see the impact of age alone with attrition so age is an important variable when we are trying to study attrition because there is a significant difference with this graph so the age should be included as a variable as an input variable when we are trying to do the modeling okay um next we'll go to the second variable which is business traveler so it is a categorical variable that tells us um whether or not a person travels for business and how often he travels 
So out of the 2940 employees that we have, so we see that most of the employees travel rarely and then we'll try to understand whether or not traveling has an impact on attrition. So since this is a categorical variable, I just created a simple table to see if there is an impact uh, of business travel and attrition. So we see... Um, <laughs> The ratio that you see between a no and yes here. So for non-travel, the ratio of 276 to uh, 24 and 416 to 138 and 1774 is to 312. This is almost similar. There is no much difference. Uh, let me do an actual numbers. 276 by 24, 416 divided by 138. 1774 divided by 312. So there's not much difference um, in the people who travel um, to see whether or not they have an attrition. So you can choose to ignore this variable because it doesn't look like um, it is having an impact on whether somebody or not has an attrition from the organization. Okay. Age we saw has an impact, but uh, the business travel does not look to uh, have a significant impact with um, the business travel does not look to have a significant impact with attrition. So you can choose to uh, ignore it. Okay. Similarly, we go to next um, the daily rate. So daily rate is again a continuous variable uh, which shows the um, rate at which an employee is being paid on a daily basis. Uh, so when we see a summary of it, it is again um, a continuous variable, the minimum being 102 to a maximum being of 1500. Uh, when I do a box plot, it looks like a normally distributed data and you can also see that from an histogram as well. Uh, but a good thing to see here is if I do the impact of daily rate on uh, attrition, Probably the daily rate does not have a very significant impact. Let me uh, go back to the histogram again to show you. So see almost all of the, the daily rate is uh, uniformly distributing, meaning to say that uh, across all the uh, 2,900 employees that we have, the daily rate was evenly distributed. And when I did a comparison of people who ate right or not from the organization based on the daily rate, there is no significant difference. There is a very small difference here. If I zoom it out, um, so this is 400 to 600. So this is somewhere around 450 or so. So there's, there's not a very significant difference compared to the range of daily rate that I have. There is not significant difference in the daily rates of people who have an attrition or not. So even daily rate you can choose to ignore when you're doing the uh, modeling. Okay, with age, we had a significant difference. With daily rate, we do not have a significant difference. And also, we saw from the histogram that the daily rate is um, not very varied. It is almost constant. The frequency of the daily rate within the employees is almost constant. So it doesn't look like having a very significant impact. So you can choose to ignore the daily rate variable as well. Okay, next we... Um, go to the department which is a categorical variable so we'll just to see uh, we'll just see a summary of it okay so see this is significant here uh, with the human resources 1656 divided by 266 and so this is evident from the data as well but I'm trying to show it more clearly Okay, so with the department as well, um, the ratio between no and yes is almost similar. Okay, the people who are right versus the people who do not are right is again similar. So department again, you can choose to ignore because there is no significant difference with respect to, there is um, nothing like 
people of a particular department have more attrition compared to people of other departments so you can choose to ignore this variable as well okay so then or maybe okay 284 is also okay so then you see that there is a different significant difference with the other departments so if you see that for a particular department um the ratio between no and yes is um different for a particular department compared to other departments so then you say that people of uh, those that particular department have a more attrition rate compared to people of the other departments so that will mean that that particular department has a significant importance when you are uh, mm, sorry yeah when you're creating a model that department variable has a significant importance and hence it should be included but with the current data set that we have there is no significant difference with each of the in uh, departments so you're okay to ignore it okay and um this is what happens when um uh in 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 the industries when we are actually working so this this is again a data set with 35 variables but this is again not huge we had actually worked with one of the data set that had some around 170 variables or something like that so we need to uh you know most of the time most of the time gets spent in doing the exploratory data analysis only because um, the models that you're creating like the neural network I created here is a two line of command that you can execute within seconds if the data is huge it, that command will take a minute or maybe one and a half minute to run but then it is again a two line of command that can be executed quickly most of the time that goes in the organizations is doing the exploratory data analysis and that needs to be done for each of the variables here so here with yeah. this data set i haven't um, done uh, so i had i had seen an overview of what the summary was so this this doesn't look like a data which contains outliers so in actual data uh, in the actual data that you will see there will be outliers as well so how will you understand whether or not the data has outliers is by studying the individual variables okay you study the individual variables whichever variable you see looks like having an outlier that needs to be treated if there's a missing value with within within a data set that needs to be treated and finally using the summaries of each of the variables you need to decide whether or not that variable needs to be included in the data set so uh, I, i've done that for each of the variables um so since this is clear now i'll quickly run through all the variables so when you do this exercise for the mini project that you're doing repeat uh this these steps in a similar manner for each of the variables then you also have this distance from home uh so that tells the distance of the employees home from the office which is a number from 1 to 29 and if you zoom this out this is a uh, very um, you know uh, intuitive as well that people who have so distance from home to your office is a significant uh, factor and that is also evident from the data so you see people who have more distances from home like uh, the yes is the yes is in the blue color so people who have more distance from home um, are more likely to have an attrition compared to people who have lesser distances from their homes so distance from home is a variable which should be used as a um, factor for impacting attrition next is the education level and the education field which are uh, categorical variables so we'll just see a table of them here so with this table i am not uh, doing the actual uh, ratios here but do the ratios of these variables to see if a particular education level if a particular education level you notice uh, has a more attrition compared to other education levels then you need to include education in um, the uh, as an independent variable but if all the education levels behave in the same way then you can 
choose to ignore it. Similar is the case with education field as well. Uh, if there is a significant uh, difference between the attrition of yes and no for any particular education field, then it should be used. Otherwise, it should be ignored. Um, now, one thing to see here when you do different models, like for example, if you're doing a um, random forest or a neural network. So even if you do not do all these steps, the model will run. Um, so especially when you're doing a random forest and you do not do these steps the model will run and um, the random forest and for that matter cart also both of these algorithms uh, choose the best variables by themselves okay because they use the like cart uses the Gini gain concept so it it sees all the variables itself as well and um, um, chooses which variable is good which variable is not good for splitting so with those algorithms even if you don't do these steps is okay but doing them is a better thing but if you don't do them is okay but with neural network if you simply pass all of um, the variables um, at once if you pass all of the variables the neural network model uh, the model will run but the accuracy will not be good so this step becomes essential when you're doing a neural network to achieve accuracy okay because with neural network there is no particular uh, you know algorithm to decide which variable is important which variable not important whatever the variables that you're passing through the neural network it will learn from all of the variables the back propagation the error rates the gradient everything will be calculated on um, each of the input variables and it has no method to decide which variable is good and which variable is not good so then the model accuracy is not very nicely so uh, very nice so especially when you're doing a neural network do this as a mandatory step okay and 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 unless you do this you won't be able to uh, also see so there could be some variables which are correlated there could be some variables which are intuitive there could be some variables which can be calculated from each other so you won't be able to understand that until you do an exploratory analysis so see like for example i show you one of the variables here um, for example this employee count so employee count is doing nothing but it is uh, like do uh, telling whether or not this employee is distinct here just to check that there are no duplicate entries so you know that this variable doesn't make sense when you're passing it to a model because uh, just by doing a quick check once on this particular variable you can decide whether or not there are uh, unique employees or not random forest doesn't know that so random forest will try to consider in one or more of the trees that it is creating random forest will try to consider it as a variable wherein you yourself know that it is not important so i just pass it at, at all okay similar is for one more variable which is uh, uh, i think over 18 here so you have an age variable which is enough to calculate the impact of age and the over 18 anyway contains all y values so you know that it is not significant the random forest doesn't know that it is not significant or it doesn't make sense so i just pass it at all okay because in case it it sees that it is significant but you know that it is not significant so it is advisable that you do not pass such variables at all um, there's another thing i'm showing you for an example with which you should avoid when you are um, doing the modeling in addition to the data set say you have a um, salary of like you had monthly rate here say you have salary of january salary of february salary of march and so on till salary of december for the employees and then you also have a total salary in your data set um, assume that um, the salaries for each of these months are different they are not the same say this is thousand this is thousand two hundred this is eleven hundred fifty this is thirteen hundred and so on um, so these are not same and then you have a total salary which is sum of 
all the salaries and you have all the variables here now these variables are may not necessarily be correlated it is possible that for uh, one employee probably uh, the salary of february was more for the second employee maybe the salary of february was lesser than january the salary of march shooted for for any reason and then um, the total salary will be accordingly so if you see salary of january salary of february salary of march in this data set it will not be correlated but the important thing to note here is that total salary contains the essence of all these variables so when you have a data set something like this ignore all of these variables include just the total salary okay so this is an additional step apart from correlation the salary of jan and feb may or may not be correlated here the salary of jan and total salary may or may not be correlated here but then the total salary captures the essence of all of these variables so if you have a data set something like this ignore all of these variables include just the total salary so i i i did this for all the variables here like we have the employee count like i showed so employee count is just to see whether or not there are duplicates in the data and uh, there are 2940 employees and uh, the count is always one here so unless you do an analysis of this step alone uh, you won't be able to determine this so this variable has no importance at all and you should ignore this okay so i kind of did that for all the variables for environment satisfaction this again is a categorical variable and you can decide whether or not to include it same was for gender it was a categorical variable same was for the hourly rate here so you see um, the hourly rate it is very much similar whether or not there is an attrition the hourly rate is very much similar there's no difference so don't include this variable when you're doing the modeling one more thing i wanted to show you was what we had seen earlier as well um, i'm doing this for all the variables and you can decide whether or not to include them okay for the monthly income so you see um, the summary of monthly income it ranges from 1009 to say 20000 approximately uh, when i do a histogram of it okay so we had seen this when i showed you the uh, air pollution well regression example uh, we had seen this but see the histogram of monthly income is highly skewed okay so this again should be considered uh before you do the modeling that there should not be any skewness in the data because if it's not normally distributed uh the data will be biased to learn more from the monthly income like here probably the monthly more people have monthly income in the ranges of uh probably 2500 to 7500 contains most of the people so the model will learn more from the employees that have salary ranges between 2500 to 7500 and lesser from the employees that have salary ranges in the um other that have salaries in the other ranges so the data should also not be skewed when you are uh, doing the modeling so when i do a log of it the skewness gets removed and hence when you are passing this variable you should not pass the monthly income you should pass log of monthly income as the uh, independent variable before doing the modeling okay so couple of things to check is one is the missing values one is the outliers then see um, whether or not they are correlated uh, the variables are correlated then also see um, what i told you in the example if one variable can be computed from the other variables then use just one of them then also see whether or not the data is has outliers or not if it has outlier sorry whether or not the data is normally distributed or not if it is not normally distributed um do a transformation and then pass uh, the transformation as a variable rather than the individual variable okay so monthly rate you monthly income you see has a significant impact on the attrition the people who have a smaller monthly income and the people who have a higher monthly income
okay i've done that for all the variables this is again uh, over 18 variable which contains all y's that all of the people are um, above 18 so that that is a totally uh, non significant variable uh, we see one overtime variable again see this tells you that over time out of 578 and 254 and then this is approximately 19220 so people who do over time have a more likelihood of having an attrition rather than people who do not do over time so over time is a significant variable um, the same thing what we saw for uh, monthly income also applies to percent salary hike um, so see this again is a heavily skewed data set so you need to uh, do a transformation of it uh, before you actually pass it so I use this uh, box Cox test which we had seen earlier when we did um, regression so I used the random um, sorry um, the lambda value here and when I plotted um, transformed value of the person salary hike the skewness looks like having been removed so then I instead of passing the person salary hike I should be passing a one upon person salary hike as an independent variable okay so you need to do that for all one more variable here was was for standard hours which is 80 for everyone so you can ignore it do that for all the variables uh, okay uh, one easy way to check for the missing values is a command that I've put here uh, either you can do it for all the variables one by one but this is one simple command uh, to check uh, the missing values all at once um, so when I run this command, I'm just checking whether or not there are any NAs in uh, any of the values and I'm creating a matrix based on that. So it shows you for each of the um, variables whether or not there are any missing values. Okay, so it shows zero, zero, zeros in all of the values means that there are no missing values in any of uh, the variables. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you.